going to call the meeting to order March 12th, 2020, um, the Sherburn Select Board. I'll start with having the town administrator reading the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, we'll amend or approve the agenda and then a period of public comment. Uh, the first item is a consent agenda with payroll warrant, a one-day liquor license for Pauline Bounds, friends of the Sherburn Library. And then next meeting dates of March 14th, that's the Saturday advisory hearing, and March 19th, regular meeting. The second item is Sherburn Picks Up, litter campaign with Kim Chester, Addie Mae Weiss, and Catherine Rocchio. The third item is consideration of recycling fees with the recycling committee, Wendy McComer, Charles Tyler, and Sean Colleen as DPW director. Item number four, Board of Health update on coronavirus with Daryl Beardsley, chair. Number five, consideration of appointment. Ken Adams to the Council on Aging for a term to expire June 15th, 2023. We have a recommendation to add um, an appointment for interim Chief Zach Ward, I mean temporary Chief Zach Ward to be temporary emergency management director and Lieutenant David Bento as assistant emergency management director. Then considerations of warrant articles. Library trustees prudent investor standard for library trusts with Henry Roush and Heidi Doyle. Item seven is 2020 annual town meeting to be held on April 28, 2020. Consideration of FY 2021 omnibus budget, capital items and warrant articles. Discussion before hearing with the advisory board on Saturday, March 14th. Discussion on select board budgets, FY 2021 prior to advisory hearing. And vote and sign final 2020 annual town meeting warrant for posting. Number eight, consideration of administration items and routine business. Finance director, FY21 budget development update and request for a reserve fund transfer for stormwater. Ms. Sean Colleen, DPW director. Town administrator, Pine Hill access road letter of support. And then under select board members, reports. And then adjourn to executive session, not to return to open session. Item one. MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to threat and potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town and the chair so declares library. Item 2, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town and the chair so declares police officers union. And item three, MGL chapter 30A section 21A subsection two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel town administrator. And that's the end. Okay. Do I have a motion to uh, approve this agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? One opposed. opposed. <clears throat> okay. Uh, first item, I have a public comment. Jeff Waldron has a comment from the Board of Health. Yeah, Jeff Waldron, uh, Select Board in 8th Surrey Lane. This is an announcement from the Board of Health um, seeking volunteers. So in the next few weeks, the Board of Health is beginning a recruitment campaign to increase the number of Sherburn's Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. The, the MRC Reserve Corps um, include medical and public health professionals as well as other community members without health care backgrounds. They engage these volunteers to strengthen public health, improve emergency response capabilities, and build community resiliency. Currently, Sherburn MRC volunteers are active at the Board of Health's annual flu immunization clinics, and there have been a number of changes in their uh, group over the past few years, so they're hoping this campaign will re-energize this important group of citizens. So please watch for announcements in the coming weeks and contact the Board of Health if you feel that you might be interested in joining. And so obviously with uh, our response to the coronavirus uh, going on right now, these, these volunteers are, are greatly needed. So if anyone is available, um, you can contact the Sherburn Board of Health. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is a consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? 
Senate. Second. Second. All in favor? Great. Uh, the next item is Sherburn picks up litter campaign. Kim, Addy, and Catherine. and thank you to our select board for hearing our motion this evening after requesting in June of 2019 that we form a group of volunteers to design an approach to the glowing problem of litter in our town I just wanted to give you a one-minute update on what we've accomplished since we last met we established a core group of volunteers and you see three of us here as and with the addition of Jean Guthrie she's our other volunteer with the support of the director of public works Sean Colleen and our town administrator David Williams the town of Sherburn has become an official chapter of keep Massachusetts beautiful we recently received cleanup kits via a grant from KMB keep Massachusetts beautiful and we'll be meeting later this month with executive director Neil Ryan to explore educational and synergistic opportunities within KMB to develop our Sherburn web page within their KMB site. Sherburn Picks Up is also now part of the Superintendent's Sustainability Task Force of the Dover Sherburn School System. Mm -hmm. Catherine Rocchio and her daughters Marigold, Isabella, Addie Mae Weiss from the DPW and Jean Guthrie have designed a social media presence for Sherburn Picks Up on Facebook, Nextdoor, Instagram, and Twitter. We have issued a press release and Addie Mae has designed a Sherburn Picks Up logo which you can see here. She's done this on t-shirts, on placards that we're putting on pop-up trash cans around town, and this is the banner that we hope to use with our uh, installation. <laughs> <laughs> We've decided to expand Jean Guthrie's annual cleanup day to a month-long effort in April. Everyone is invited to sign up online via the Sherburn Town homepage. We have been strongly supported by our DPW. Director Sean Colleen will see that volunteers have the use of signs, vests, gloves, bags, and pickers as they need them. I would like to offer a congratulations to Detective James Godino and the Sherburn Police Department for their successful sting operation against a serial litterer who had single-handedly deposited over 2,500 pieces of litter on the streets of Sherburn over the past 18 months. And now to our motion. Please imagine what would happen if every piece of litter that fell to the ground begins to emit a piercing sound like a house alarm that does not cease until someone picks it up? Sometime to get people's attention, you need to make a little noise. Well, softly falling litter doesn't make any noise, so we've decided to make some art. We plan to appeal to everyone's sense of sight with our art installation of litter letters spelling the word Y and containing litter collected by Sher Sherburn residents. We're seeking permission for an art installation to be sited on town property. The art installation of a litter letters project, six foot high letters spelling out the word Y to be built in rebar and chicken wire by Sherburn volunteers and installed for a period of six weeks at the 1627 split letters to serve as display and vessels for litter collected by Sherburn Picks Up and can be um, emptied and reused as we see fit in other places in the town or at the schools. Thank you. So, does anybody have any questions about the what they're proposing? I know we've seen some pictures and, I, and I've seen, I, you guys have shown me some in the past too of uh, some of these art installations that have been in other places. Um, I think you guys have done a great job with getting the awareness out, and and I think this is an important thing to do. I was going to add one thing. I'm still the chair of the Boy Scout troop in town, so I'll let them know. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. If I could, just to commend you for your persistence in two issues. Number one, the pursuit of that individual who has been littering the town. Hooray for you. Hooray for the police department to resolve that issue. Secondly, in pursuing the cleanup of our town, thank you so much for doing this. Much appreciated. You're so welcome. We're very happy to be involved. So do I have a motion to grant permission for the art installation? So moved. Second. All in favor? Just a quick note, the uh, photos of the uh, art installation is really cool. Is yeah. great? They're really we really will get people's attention, which is which is good. And we will be the first in New England to do this. Cool. cool. So it'll be thank, very, you. Very cool. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When is DPW Day again? 
All right, I want to. We've got we've got a long agenda tonight, so I want to keep moving here. Um, number three on the agenda is consideration of recycling fees with Charles Tyler. <coughs> Uh, yes, hello. This is uh, more or less something that uh, came up during our joint uh, budget meeting with advisory. Um, we were talking about uh, Sean's budget for, for the transfer station and how the recycling fees have gone up. The recycling budgets have gone up uh, more than, than our fees. So um, our fees have been the same for a long period of time. And we were requested to kind of come up with something that would uh, more reflect the fees that were charged. Uh, and the recycling committee had some discussion and came up with a list. I think you have the list in your hands there. Um, mattresses are currently graduated in price based on the size, and we're proposing that there be a, a $20 a piece for mattresses. Air conditioners are currently $20 each. So we're requesting that, that that fee be put up to $25 each, which is what the, uh, the recycling company is charging us right now for that. Um, Carpets will be taken off the list because we haven't recycled those for quite a while anyway, uh, and there, there are not that many of them. Uh, computer monitors would stay the same at $10 each. Dehumidifiers are currently $10 each, and we were proposing that they be $10 each. However, our, our uh, recycling uh, contractor has started charging $25 for dehumidifiers as well because they have Freon in them, and, and that's why they, they do that. So um, we, we have not come up with a, a separate uh, proposal for that. But we might want to think about raising that to like 20 as well to, to make up for that a little bit. Not, not making it as much as the, the company is charging us, but raising it so that it's less painful to the, to the town budget and uh, so that we could do that. Um, again, mattresses, the uh, same as box springs. We're, we're looking at $20 per piece, no matter what the size is, which doesn't bring us up to even on the, on the budget, but, but uh, takes away a lot of the sting. Uh, in, in the budget position. Microwaves would go from $10 to $15 each. Propane tanks would stay at, at uh, $5 each. They're, they're uh, a relatively minor problem. Uh, refrigerators uh, have been $20 each for years and years. They're now being costing us $50 per unit uh, to send a refrigerator to our recycler. We're recommending that they, uh, the fees go up to $40 each for those. Smaller refrigerators are actually uh, being billed at $30 each now. And we, we talked about making that $30 each. That, that could go down five or, or so, but $30 each is what we proposed. Uh, tires would stay the same. Toilets and sinks are currently $15 each for recycling the porcelain. And uh, it's, it's costing us more like $20 a piece uh, to do that. They, they charge us $20 a piece if they're not stripped. Right now we have volunteers who are taking the, the, uh, the non-porcelain stuff off, so, so it works out well for us, but there's a $100 label, labor charge when they come and pick them up as well. So um, $20 each is what we're uh, proposing for that. And again, t uh, CRT or flat screen TVs would stay at $10. They're, they're uh, charged on a per pound basis, so we, we're, we're doing pretty well in that light. Uh, also, we would like to uh, propose that the fees that are collected that way are tracked a little bit better so that credit can be given back to the budget that they're actually uh, helping so, so we don't end up being shocked by the budget that's, that's going up without actually having that ameliorating uh, fee uh, amount that's going, going back to the general fund. So that's our presentation. Do you have any questions? Uh, are air conditioners on here? Are they the same as dehumidifiers? Air conditioners run around the top. Yeah, oh, 20, right. yeah twenty-five dollars is yeah. No, it's only yeah. five. Yeah, bucks. yeah. I, I and then, then that's way. that's for a what they call a small air conditioner. Uh, larger air conditioners they charge as much as a refrigerator because the coil is the same and yeah. the compressor is the same. No, thank you for going through this after our meeting with advisory that day. This makes sense that we increase these fees based on what we're having to pay to get rid of the stuff. So well, actually, there are a number of them where we're not we're mm -hmm. out of pocket. I think at a minimum we should charge. Where it's a set fee, known fee, not by the pound. I think we should charge what it costs the town. You know, the well, we want to divert the stream, though, is the thing. You want to make sure you encourage That's historically not been a problem in the 35 years I've been in Sherwood. Right? This does yeah. not look like uh, we, 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 we do We do get some things coming in uh, that the DPW brings in from uh, odd places in town, uh, you know, Prospect Street. Yeah, and yeah, I, I just don't think we should be out of pocket. I, mean, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. Like the one 
for instance, that you said was 50, I think it was the refrigerators. So yeah. You right. should charge people $50 right. for them. You know, actually, a refrigerator, you try to encourage people because if you buy a new refrigerator, they'll take, often take the old one. They will money. take it for less than, than the $50. They yeah. take it for less right. than the $40. Right. Even. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're, get, they're doing that for demand side. And, and the power company is still picking up working refrigerators for free from, yeah. from houses if they're working. And I think you should increase that dehumidifier price. I know you didn't on here, but you said it has gone up to the, would you say 25? 25 is what, yeah. So we should have that one at 25 as well. Great. I really, I think we should be charging what we're paying. So you're suggesting I should take that right column of what we're paying and make the fees reflect yeah. that. But I agree with Chuck, I think. Yeah. Okay. So can I make a motion to approve with the addition of $25 for dehumidifiers and $50 for refrigerators? Yes. Is there anything else that's at cost that we missed? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Is there anything else listed here that's less than cost? Uh, mattresses are costing us a little bit less. They, they, they go anywhere between 22 and 25 after the delivery fee that we're paying, um, rather than the $20. So, but, but if you charge $25 for a mattress and a box spring, somebody's paying $50 to bring in a twin mattress and a twin box spring, it seems like quite a bit. So, so we're, we're trying to temper that. And also, you know, people pay a lot of taxes in this town, and they maybe should be able to get some amount of service for, for that and, and some. How do you handle those mattresses? Everyone's getting those uh, foam, memory foam mattresses now. They, they, do not, they do not take the foam mattresses okay. at, at the mattress recycling place. So, yeah, yeah those are, hmm. yeah. Okay, so Paul has a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. All right. We have number four, the Board of Health update. Is anybody here? Is Matt? I don't know. I just texted them. I can tell I thought them Matt walked in. Yeah. Could you tell them to come in? Yeah, yeah, please. please. We've been so. meeting all week long. Yes. <clears throat> Everybody. In Dover and here, Council on Aging. We met with uh, Zach and uh, David Bento on Tuesday. So we've had probably four or five meetings and two or three calls. We were on a call yesterday with the state uh, uh, Department of Public Health for two hours. Uh, so we're getting a lot of input uh, from boards of health all over the state, actually. The biggest issue, like you read in the national news, is testing, lack of testing. Mm -hmm. The state, as of whatever day that was, Wednesday, has 2,000 test kits total. They had, I saw today they got 5,000 more, yeah, so they, they can do four times the amount of testing that they've been doing. Yeah. I saw a news story. A, so. a number of the folks from the Biogen meeting went to Mass General. Yes. Wanted to be tested. Yes. Yep, that's right. They're coming. When they're ready. And they closed oh, still and they closed the Long Wharf Marriott also. <laughs> so so oh, um, just before you jump into that, since they're not here, I think that next the next item with the appointments, well, let's just make a motion to approve I'll, I'm gonna make a motion to approve the appointments of Ken Adams to the Council on Aging for term to expire June fifteenth, twenty twenty three, Zach Ward and Dave Bento for the what can you repeat those, David? The it would be Zach Ward, temporary emergency management director that goes along with his, his position. Yep. And then um, Lieutenant David Bento as assistant emergency management director and that would that is uh, a temporary position okay. basically too. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. You want to jump the reserve fund? I have a couple yeah. other uh, health items. I can well, yeah, I kind of want Daryl here to do yeah. the Board of Health items. Um, I thought they were here for our agenda, not right for... Yeah, they, Why can't they come over? Sean, can you just open up the thing and it'll just be like, like a big party? <laughs> well, what, one thing I'll, I could bring up on the subject, but doesn't necessarily only involve them, is I think we're going to have to think about, um, particularly on Saturday, allocating a portion of the reserve fund for costs associated with coronavirus. So for example, Zach will probably be here shortly, but they've already bought four or five thousand dollars worth of personal protective equipment from the fire department and EMTs. So we're probably going to have some expenditures. The visiting nurse association is likely to charge us more than our usual stipend. So we'll have our reserve funds set up, but I think there'll, there'll need to be some allocated, just like the state and the federal government has done for uh, coronavirus. All right. Thanks for coming. I was almost down to my ammo impressions. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to get through the agenda as fast as we can. So just so we're not all here, you know. Yeah, yeah. That good. <laughs> Do you want me over here? Yes, please. Right. Yes. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, 
100% organized. Yeah. It's been just a tad busy. Sure. So, I just need my notes. I just wanted to go over a bit on where we are, although saying where we are is so hard because it's, everything's been moving so fast and changing. Uh, and part of that is also, and just to mention, because we heard some feedback that people were concerned that the Board of Health wasn't doing anything or the town, and, and I would say that's far from what's been going on. Uh, so I did want to share some of the information about what's been happening. So just a moment. Okay. All right, uh, so the Board of Health has been working on coronavirus, also called COVID-19 for coronavirus identification by being starting in 2019. So we've been working on it since January and it's been a very fast moving issue and the board's been working very hard and others in town with us to collect and keep up with all the information and the changing circumstances. and. The good news is that we've been putting a lot of systems into place. We've been really establishing good lines of communication with all sorts of groups relevant to this emergency and the response to it. And today, uh, today, yesterday, there was <laughs> a Department of Public Health or DPH conference call that uh, I know that the first conference call of that sort had about 800 people dialing into it from around the state from boards of health and and other groups. And I would say that as I was listening to that call yesterday that Sherborne is ahead of the curve on preparedness based on the types of questions that were being asked by folks from other communities. Uh, and I think there are a few reasons for that. First is that um, we have Ellen Hartnett and her experience and knowledge has been so valuable in guiding us as to what we need to do. And she, not only has she participated, as mentioned before, in emergency preparedness at the regional level for a long time, uh, but she has the experience of H1N1 under her belt. And as she refers to it, it was more like a warm up exercise for this. So, uh, also, we share us, since we share a school district with Dover. And also in, in the recent past, probably the last year and a half or so, we've been collaborating more with the Board of Health in Dover uh, around school issues. And then there is some crossover in issues, so we're looking to build some resiliency and uh, avoid redundancy of effort. But so we've already had an established relationship with Dover and that helped. So we formed a working group between the two towns so from our Board of Health, uh, it's Matt Vitale and me, and then from the Dover uh, side, there is uh, one doctor on their board at the moment, well, two doctors, but one who's part of the working group, Stephen Kruskal, and there is someone who uh, will be running for the Board of Health soon, and she is a recently retired okay. physician. And I have to say, I think it's been an excellent collaboration in terms of I think trying to rapidly get concordance across the two towns and being able to provide. Do you want to come up here too? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great on camera. <laughs> At least the back of my head. Um, so, I, so we work closely with the Dover Board of Health, I think really with the goal of identifying quickly the lines of communication and getting consistent messaging so that we don't have different policies at Pine Hill and Chickering, for example, given that they're under the jurisdictions of the different boards. I think that has worked well. Um, uh, and we've also worked closely with the school as well. I would also just say the public health nurse has been incredible as this has been astronomically busy. I think to give a little bit of framing for um, one of the recent contacts she encountered, I won't share what town it was in or whether it was Arkney, the contract trace was 60 people. And so that 60 phone calls that she's making for a single case that she's needing to do a contact trace for. So as we think about the scale of the ask, um, she's really been doing yeoman's work as well. And so I think we've been able to quickly navigate what I would say is a fairly limited state guidance in terms of when do you close schools, how do you manage that. Um, 
I think one of the things that has been challenging has been we can get general guidance very easily from the state, but specific guidance about a specific household or a specific case tends to devolve to local authority, which you're then trying to figure out how to be consistent with other towns or other communities, whether it's about communication or quarantine decisions. So we prospectively worked on a set of pathways so that if we do have cases identified, we have a predefined pathway for this is what will happen with quarantine, this is what will happen with contact trace. These are the qualifications if there's an absence of state guidance. We've said that if there is state guidance, we'll revert to that guidance. If there's absence of state guidance, we want to kind of pre-specify this is plan A, this is plan B, this is plan C in terms of what happens with isolation. That too remains a work in flux. So we wrote it last week. I've revised it three times since then with new data and new guidance, and I expect will be two more revisions by the end of next week. Um, but I think it's the, the time and effort's worth it to just be prepared so that when it comes up. Um, and I'd also say having started meeting early we it was not this i mean this week has been beyond compare and uh but starting several weeks ago and talking to representatives from different groups like the visiting nurse association the councils on aging uh, we met with the lepc uh, local emergency planning committee for the town here and we're just talking this evening we'll talk some more about keeping that collaboration going, input from the select board. So having that up front has enabled us to survive the intensity and the rapidly evolving situation of this week. Can, um, can so I just share? Yes. COA yeah. also, COA's been yep. very yes. involved. Yes, COA, yeah. churches yeah. have been involved. So it's been quite, quite so wide reaching. Just one, one second, what? Yeah. I was just gonna say for the at least for the listeners that aren't yeah. sure who he is. Can you oh. introduce? Uh, so Matt I'm, Lewis? yeah, I'm Matt Vitale. I'm a board of health member for the town of Sherburn and clinically I'm a hospitalist at Brigham and Women's Hospital where we also are thinking quite a bit about COVID. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it sure felt it this week. Um, and so what I'd love to do is kind of give you guys just a little bit of background in terms of the current pathways so that you're familiar with them because I think that informs the other policy choices we've reached which I think are worth sharing here. And I think that should be less than five minutes and then focus into next steps and where we need to kind of engage as a community. Does that sound okay? Yes, that's good. So right now in the state of Massachusetts, we're still li uh, limited uh, in terms of the testing we can do. That should change in the next couple of weeks if all goes well. So far, everything has not gone well, so it's a little harder to predict. The current criteria is that people have to have a combination of risk factors and symptoms to qualify for testing, which has to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis by Mass DPH. The current criteria are an at-risk contact, meaning somebody with identified COVID, uh, travel to an at-risk area, so the uh, level three countries previously, or the new criteria they most recently added was an unexplained respiratory infection that is severe. The def and could you explain yeah. that uh, how in the letter that went out from the schools, presumptive positive is uh, So presumptive positive that means that Mass DPH did the test, but CDC hasn't confirmed it. So I think right now we've got 105 presumptive positive tests and two confirmed. That is the same test just being run in different labs, and so that just means the CDC hasn't processed the samples yet. In uh, Sherburn? No, no, uh, no. In the state in the of state Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so, so there's 105 cases case statewide that have been presumptive positive. The vast majority of those have been associated with the Biogen meeting. Um, there are several that have been uh, kind of state uh, travel connected and then there's some concern I think in Berkshire County about a pattern of community spread where there's some more unexplained cases so I think the vast majority that we've seen so far have been cases that we can identify an association for that should be a little bit less reassuring than it sounds since an association by definition is the criteria for testing so the fact that we found some that didn't meet the criteria of having a contact or at-risk travel that is part of why that's all we found. So I think it, we can infer that the presence of negative testing means that it's not in our community or that it's not in communities around us. Um, the pathway right now is if somebody was swabbed, uh, so they'd get a swab in their nose, a swab in their throat, that would then go to the state lab for confirmation. The target for that's a 24-hour turnaround time. I think that that is a target and they have been incredibly taxed in terms of a lot of volume. Uh, so we've seen some cases take longer than that to turn around. I would use 48 hours as a general ballpark and up to 72 hours is not unheard of. That would then come back and be identified as this is a positive case. That would then trigger our uh, public health nurse, which is a contracted service with Walpole VNA, to start the contact trace. They, she then reaches out to the 
um, individual and does a contact trace pathway to identify close contacts. Um, I believe the criteria for that is uh, within six feet for more than 15 minutes, so you can see how extensive that can be. She then reaches out to those contacts to identify if they're symptomatic or not. So again, this can be a pretty extensive pattern of communication. The current pathway that we've uh, adopted given the um, current restrictions on testing that are risk-based, meaning anybody who's tested is at fairly high pretest risk of the disease. Is it somebody who is pending testing? The requirement is for uh, quarantine of the individual as well as their household until the, the testing's returned. That typically would impact two to three days for the average person, depending on, um, on kind of the time of day for when the test was drawn. Um, for people who are PCR positive, our current requirement is for 14 days of isolation. The state has defined guidance for when they can come off isolation. Isolation means you have the disease and we're trying to protect other people from it. Quarantine means that you might have the disease and we're trying to see what happens before having you in the broader community. So the individual patient is in isolation. They would remain in isolation until they have two negative swabs and are asymptomatic. That would typically take about 14 days with the kinetics we see in the disease. One area we're seeking more guidance from the state is how to handle household contacts of a positive case in terms of the duration of quarantine. Um, the reason that's relevant is if we consider the cruise ship cases that happened um, uh, in Tokyo and then had people re-quarantined in California, if you can't break the cycle of transmission, the fact that there's a 14-day quarantine doesn't mean that the day, person who caught it on day 12 isn't contagious on day 14. So that's an area we're seeking more guidance. I think we still have time to get that guidance before it becomes relevant for us. Um, if somebody tests negative with the PCR, our prior guidance was to remain on quarantine. We got guidance on the call yesterday that we don't need to do that, that a negative PCR means that the person can come off quarantine. Um, the other piece, uh, so that's kind of the, the framework. I'm so good at talking, but uh, I want to pause there to see if there are questions. Lot to take in. <laughs> You're not kidding. Um, so the and other we could also fill you in on. I, mean, I think in a way the the school story has become much easier, but we've yeah. had major policy decisions that have changed three, four times uh, in the uh, past few days. And so. I want to. I think there's so much we could share. I see a strong <laughs> interest in brevity, and I would say that the town of Sherburn is absolutely getting the value of the zero dollar salary that I get paid to do this <laughs> job. Um, so there's been extensive discussions with the school. There's late breaking news uh, this evening, not related to new contacts, but new decision making. So as many of us have seen today, throughout the region, schools are closing. One of the things that we have to look at is there's different phases as you deal with epidemic disease. The first is containment. The second is kind of mitigation. and it's not totally clear which one we're in. As we see surrounding schools close, it doesn't make sense to be the school that didn't close, and so we've recommended closing the school. The district's gonna be closed for the next two weeks, starting, including classes tomorrow. That communication should be going out shortly. Um, it's out? It's out. Yes. Perfect. It is. Uh, so starting tomorrow? So to tomorrow will affect school and moving forward. It will be closed tomorrow? So no school tomorrow on Friday the 13th. Auspicious day. Thanks, Yeah. <laughs> no, we haven't um, gotten any and, communication uh, from the schools yet. Yeah, so I think I we, were, we, were, we, were, we were finalizing. Uh -huh. right here. I, I would say it's, it is late breaking in that we've been finalizing the communication up to about 17 minutes ago, so don't take it personally. <laughs> um, and so the plan for that right now is a provisional closure for two weeks, including school and associated extracurricular activities. We're going to reassess next week with another communication to the schools. That will be by the joint. Uh, kind of working group that represent the Sherburn Board of Health, the Dover Board of Health, and working closely with the district. I think one of the other things that we acknowledge, and I'm sure you guys get the questions too, one of our most important jobs is to protect our community members who are imp impacted by the disease, because as scared as we all are, they're having a worse week than we are, and so this has been a source of significant question and concerns. The approach we've taken at the district level is to limit it to the district level because if testing is, wasn't in your kid's school, it doesn't mean that COVID's not in your kid's school. And so if folks are being compromised, our recommendation had been to remain out of school. Um, I think some of that will become increasingly relevant as we do, I, my own anticipations, I suspect we'll see more cases in the community. I think now we need to plan for it. I don't intend to say we've got two Sherburn residents or four Sherburn residents or here's a TikTok update because I don't think it changes the pattern of risk. If we get to a place with community spread, whether it's four or 10 or 20, does not make it safer, does not make it less safe. It means that we need to take those actions. I think the other thing that we've said is that, again, 
we are doing so many things at once that the likelihood of the board to be able to push out communication that rivals the CDC or the state is low. We will do our best to respond to individual questions and to be a resource for members of the community, but would continue to direct people to look at the CDC Mass DPH fire away. Yep, so as part of that, we have managed to get some more information up onto the town website. So now there's a banner that will then take you to a page that has more information, including some really great links, uh, in particular the World Health Organization uh, information uh, directed at private individuals is extensive and uh, certainly worth taking a look at. Um, and then there are some other websites listed, but one thing that we're also looking for is for people who might be interested in helping out we're not quite sure what that help will look like exactly, but we have something called a medical reserve corps. We already have people who are on that corps, but we'll probably need more. And even though it has the name medical reserve corps, you do not need any medical experience because as you can imagine, there could be all sorts of tasks that do not require that sort of experience, whether it's just fielding questions or helping distribute food or we don't know, but it could be anything along those lines and might even be something that uh, high school students looking for community service could participate in in a safe and distant way. So. so I think the last piece of context I would share just to inform the decision making that follows is as you look at how people do with COVID, it varies dramatically by age. I think that's well represented in the popular media. But while lots of our attention is focused on schools, lots of our community risk is supporting our older adults or folks with chronic disease conditions. And I think that um, that's part of where we need to kind of look at the next phase of preparedness as well as the emergency response plan for the town and continuity of operations plans for the boards. So I think that if I think about where our risk is, the schools in some way are the easiest part because it's low risk, heavily regulated with central communications and lots of digital access. I think for our COA population, for our church populations, those things become more complicated. And I think figuring out how do we help support as a community our most vulnerable members is one of the important things that our infrastructure needs to develop, especially around access, I think, to food, um, medications, and other pieces that folks who are appropriately self-isolating may have difficulty getting access to and thinking about what we can do there. Um, I think and that's... Right, and I so we've gone into that to some degree with this COA, I have but... To step out for just a second. So yeah, always use more I, I, I talked this afternoon with Sue Kelleher, who's our new uh, COA director, as most people in town know. So she's setting up, they're, they're doing food shopping, they're getting medicines for people, they're talking about um, maybe stockpiling some common supplies that people could need. So they're also looking for volunteers and I have a call with her again tomorrow. So the COA is very, they produced a, uh, I think it's a postcard or a flyer that's going to go to everyone's house. Uh, that that's already. the one that went to Woodhaven. Woodhaven, okay. And then we're working on something they're working on a postcard, postcard but, size. But the COA is actively, um, uh, engaged in helping, they're doing wellness checks, they're work, ramping that up and uh, hope to be able to provide support to seniors, either concentrated at Woodhaven or seniors that live throughout the town, even more so perhaps because they might be living alone. So um, they, they're very active in that. I'll know more, Sue and I are, are meeting tomorrow, like I said, to, to understand what their plans are. And my biggest concern is what the gaps are where they need help. So could I add to that a little bit? Yeah, please. Uh, and, and some of my towns, some of the things that seniors need are not obvious. So we had somebody who was supposed to be quarantined, and uh, he ran out of cigarettes, and had nobody in his house to get him cigarettes, and he was addicted to cigarettes. You would think if you have a respiratory illness, you would not be wanting to smoke. So he went down to the local convenience store to get the cigarettes. When you talk about delivering stuff, it's nice to talk about delivering the good stuff, the food and everything else, but some people need things that we wouldn't normally want to deliver. And in that case, we asked a police officer to pick up some cigarettes and leave it on the porch for the guy so he didn't have to go out. Some of the uh, senior citizens, some of the communities I work with are alone they don't have food, they don't have uh, medicines, so they run out of medicine, they have a prescription, they need to get the prescription. Uh, some of the pharmacies deliver, 
some don't. Uh, so, to pet some food, extent, pet they, food's another example. Pet food could be they pet make food stock up and they yes. haven't got pet supplies. Yes, there's there's like a whole variety of of, uh, of things and. Uh, like the alcoholic who needs alcohol. And you might say, why would a government or volunteers go bring alcohol to an alcoholic? But if you don't do that, then the tendency is to slip out the back and try and get to a liquor store. So sometimes you gotta take the best of the situation. So it's nice to hear that things are being delivered. Well, they're starting. Or started to be delivered, but it, it Part of that delivery process needs to find out from the individuals directly what their needs are, mm -hmm. not what we think their needs are. And that was actually part of the plan with the COAs is to, whether by a survey or questionnaire, to ask them what is it that they need help with. So, um, but those are categories that really didn't come up in our discussion, so we will have to add those. <laughs> so the other point I want to make is the point that I raised in an email to you that, uh, the Board of Selectmen has authority with the Board of Health to shut down events by order, by vote of the board. Not just your efforts in asking people to do things, but we have actually the legal authority to shut things down. And so I had warned you in advance that I'd ask you if there was anything that the Board of Health felt that we should vote that should be shut down. Where people congregate and where there's a risk of spread of disease. So, okay. there's so, the question, as uh, promised. We had negotiated on this issue several times for, you know, what kind of events might be allowed at the school. Which ones would be, which ones wouldn't be. Uh, that is now a moot issue, so we don't really have to agonize over that uh, at this time. Um, the councils on aging in both Dover and Sherborne have been canceling events. Uh, I spoke to one church so far. I have two more to speak to in our town. And they understood the issues, but again, I spoke to them a day and a half ago, so the information needs to be updated and things have ratcheted up. So and they really, we will recommend against them having events. It does get difficult. We were talking about this today that Church is a great source of support in other ways for people, and so I don't know what the nuances might be around that, whether they come in to meet individually with people and maintain the social distancing and that sort of thing, and uh, increased clean, cleaning and sanitizing is going on uh, in both uh, all of the public buildings here in town and the schools, and the churches are going to be looking at that too. So. Have you looked at the uh, agenda for the Sherburne Community Foundation? Uh, we have not gotten to that yet. Oh, but they did cancel the movie for this <coughs> Friday night. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are aware of the issues, but it's just that how much and what might be variations, odd variations on things. Even though the SATs, I don't know what's going to happen with that now. They were scheduled to take place this weekend. It got moved out to late in the month, just in case things changed. But we had discussed if those had to go forward, that students be spread out during the testing. So they had at least six feet between them. And then to make sure that during any breaks in the testing that they weren't congregating, that they were staying apart. And again, it's not because the risk is so high for uh, for youth, but more that they are then vectors out into the community if they um, are carrying the virus. Well, so, earlier today we approved a liquor license for an event of up to 100 people, friends of the Sherburn Library. Okay, so that's uh, not a that great kind of event. Oh, Mary, you, Mary, do you have? Oh. I, I might have an update there. I spoke with Elizabeth Johnston, and she had informed me that the friends were going to be delivering sounds like most likely now that the schools have been closed that they will be canceling that event for tomorrow night. But I know that they were just deliberating on it, so if you have a recommendation. Yeah, I think uh, that's March 28th, right? We have a recommendation that things be postponed. We're not sure, you know, to yeah, when. It's scheduled for March 28th, but 
Yeah. Or I don't know if these are, it, it depends. There are some things that we know the school had planned that they have an April 1st deadline of, you know, a go, no go yeah. on it and that sort of thing. So they're going to wait on some. They're going to cancel or just assume maybe it'll be delayed until we yeah. get a clearer picture. It's when you have an part of our concern is that when you have an event, people don't want to miss out, and you don't know who's vulnerable necessarily. Um, so there is some freedom of choice, but it's also a community effort to stop the spread. So the gatherings, even though no one who attends may suffer, it's still a, a route for spreading. And a lot of the concerns uh, and lessons learned from other countries are that when things start to ramp up too fast, which is the big concern, is that hospitals and other medical facilities just can't handle the surge. So that's part of the issue, too. So even if you want to give good care to people, it gets harder and harder. So. I mean, and, and probably what I'm sorry, Rebecca, was kind of well on for And the probably the characteristics of COVID 19, unlike some of the other <coughs> coronaviruses, is that it is contagious prior to when the patient's are symptomatic. So that's one of the risk factors that is really hard to. Um, mitigate when people are gathering. Mm -hmm. Is there any data on how long it's contagious after symptoms have come and gone? After someone's had it? Uh, yeah. You know, Matt would be better to answer that, but I would say nothing's clear at the moment, and that's been one of the things that's been difficult is the data is relatively scant on this, and so we're doing proactive measures, and we've been trying to balance, you know, how proactive we be um, against other things but as as it's been ramping up in a way the decisions are getting easier because um, there's a surge and and there's a cohesiveness in, in response now in the area uh, so in terms of meetings though so some of the issues are I've seen some other towns who talk about canceling all non-essential meetings which begs the question to me of then what is an essential meeting? And we've asked, and I know David Williams has been in touch with the um, Massachusetts Municipal Association, MMA, to get some guidance on this. For uh, the Board of Health has regulations, we are required to make decisions on things within a certain number of days after they are submitted to us. So do we proceed with that? Is there any relief from those kind of deadlines, that's certainly one question. Are there alternative ways of holding the meetings if we're not holding them in person uh, that are still fair to open meeting law? It would be great to have some guidance because to think that, or advisory who's meeting this weekend, have to make decisions on the budget, but is it fair that everyone else can stay home but these people have to get together or people have to come and present on their budgets and if people want to ask questions, is there a way to do that or raise issues? And it's... Oh, I think I said to you in, in an email with a copy to the board that we are working on having the governor submit emergency legislation that would address a, a lot of those issues. Uh, but before we leave the issue of meetings, I want to be sure there isn't a vote of this board that you would like to have to support any activity with regard to these public meetings, these okay, general so, public meetings. Uh, oh, general run by the town or oh, no. any organization in town? Any organization in town. So we are strongly recommending, that's what we've been talking about with Dover, to all of the daycare, private schools, churches, um, senior groups, that they not have large gatherings. So and that they avoid the, it. So do you want the vote of the board to this to that same effect. Ah, just in time. For, do we want a, a vote uh, on behalf of the select board to support board of health on recommendations or requirements for events? Yeah, I think so. Okay, recommendation or requirement. Yeah, there's a statute, uh, 111-104, uh, that says that the board of selectmen 
in conjunction with the Board of Health, can issue orders regarding public events within the town. So the question is, do you want a vote of this board? And if so, tell me the words and I'll make the motion. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just need a second, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> We've been using the language in our discussions of strongly recommend. Yeah. It's, what I would say is I would start with the strongly recommend, and we may rapidly progress to require. I think the language also said, please take the, the least restrictive pathway possible. I think we're still at a recommend pathway. I think a week from now, we may <coughs> need a require pathway. So you do not want to vote? So the answer no, the we do want to no. vote. But <laughs> the wording is not that we require that those groups and organizations not have we strongly recommend events, but the, strongly yeah. recommend that they do not. And then <coughs> But we do have the power to require. We do. They're not at that point yet is what he's saying. So, so what, what I would say is I think this is so rapidly evolving right now. We don't have general guidance that says everything is required. And as we start to say things are required, thinking about things like church services or other impacts that may be profound on the sort of individual, especially when facing something like pandemic disease. I think that to the degree possible, I would love for us to be able to work with members of our community to share the guidance and to say, here's what we think you should do. I feel like if we start with require, we don't even have a chance at that conversation because we're saying you have to do it. And I think we're gonna have some very, very complicated choices to make together. So I would say if it were me, if I were the decider in making a choice about a meeting, I would cancel and not hold it because I think that's the way to reduce our collective risk. But I also think people could believe different things than I do, and the more that we can engage with them, we need to do that, because it's gonna be a really tough road ahead. We need to be in this together. So what's the strong recommendation? What size? Uh, so I, I, would, I would strongly recommend against any assembly larger than 50 people. I don't think we've got a clear and definitive, this is exactly the right number. I've seen 1,000, I've seen 150, I've seen 100. I think 50 is small. I think it makes things like contact tracing manageable. Um, but I wouldn't say, 50 is an absolute cutoff, 49 is completely safe, and 51 is completely reckless. I think that it's guidance, and that's part of why I would include it in a recommendation. I think, again, we may get more central guidance from the state. So why don't I move that the Board of Selectmen supports the Board of Health and its <coughs> recommendations, its strong recommendation to not have events of more than 50 people. Is that? Sounds good. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? I think the biggest impact is obviously the schools, which we've talked about at some length, and the, the, the churches. Mm -hmm. um, it's a recommendation, so it's advice, but um, I know they've already adjusted a number of things. And I do like it as a recommendation because then you can include people in the discussion and not just say this is the way you're going to do it. I, I think at this point of the conversation, it's good. I think there's no more important time as a community for us to pull together probably in the last hundred years than the next six months. And exactly. so this feels like the way to do that. Okay. I'd also say that the folks that we've been meeting with are on board with this. They just wanted direction and to know what to do themselves. Uh, They've added good information into the discussion. They recognize what the issues are. It hasn't been, di I mean, it's difficult for the other reasons I mentioned, for people who find comfort in uh, attending church services, that will be hard to give up, especially if then you're going into isolation the rest of the time. Not, not the isolation Matt <laughs> discussed, but choosing to social distance oneself so as to not uh, catch the virus so but this discussion is important for people to know that there is the power absolutely in the government to require a, the shutdown of some event that you all deem to be unsafe yes so at this mm -hmm. point we're keeping it at the recommend and talk this point of view but that power so that everybody knows that that power is here and would be exercised if warranted. Yes. I'd also say for events uh, that are held with below 50 people, being able to not be crowded is important. Uh, that distance from someone's breathing space, breathing impact space is important. 
uh, having good sanitation and sanitation options, uh, certainly good sanitation following an event so that if the space gets used by others afterwards that it has been cleaned up. So there are other things that go with that and that's what we'll be working with people about. Re Rebecca, I know you had a comment. Oh, I'm just going to add, you can wear a mask, there are measures that can be taken. Thank you. So One thing I was going to add on this subject, we didn't put a timeline on this. Yeah. We want to say until further notice. We didn't say for a period of time on this recommendation. Is that not necessary, you think? Because we're going to be to accept your we're going to be a big recipient amendment. of the decision because we're going to have to consider all town meeting on the call with the Department of Public Health, which you probably in your state discussions will hear. All the towns are thinking about how to handle their annual, uh, town, annual town meeting. Duxbury has an annual town meeting, and not only is it 600 people, but they somehow share clickers between people. Oh, <laughs> so That's, um, well, our annual town meeting is also still not until April 28th, so we have some time, I think, to make a decision on yeah, that. But that's um, actually that what, long. What did you say, Jackie? Six weeks away. Six weeks? Yeah. Okay. But you'll be sending out the notices in right. two weeks, probably. Could, could I call a question on this yes. motion? All those in favor? Because I do have a second motion I want to make while they're here, which is that most of the communities are asking, and this is a request to all boards and committees in the town, to postpone for 30 days any non-essential meetings. And those committees that are meeting to address only essential matters and not matters that can be dealt with later, so that the meetings are as short as possible. So first I want to make that as a motion, but I want to explain why, how that works, because you raised the question of uh, what's an essential meeting and what's a non-essential meeting. And that's something that, so I participated in a phone call with 125 communities about this issue and so it's pretty well been thrashed out most places I think you the Board of Health know what's essential and what's not essential it's not for us to tell you what you think is essential but generally the standard is what's required by statute in your case it's going to be what's required by the public health and safety something like the uh, like uh, Rick Novak at the Board of Appeals He's a very smart guy, he's a lawyer. He knows what's essential, he knows what's not essential. We're, in the legislation we're trying to put together, we're trying to extend all the permits, we're trying to extend all the times for filings, we're trying to eliminate constructive grants so they don't have to have meetings. But every board and committee, particularly the regulatory boards, which Board of Health and the Board of Appeals and the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board, can figure out for themselves what's essential and not essential. Okay, it's and not really for us to try to do a comprehensive definition of that. It's a request. It's not a mandatory item. It's to direct everybody not to have these meetings where they sit around and socialize essentially for a couple of hours and talk about something that they're going to do six months from now. <laughs> In the discussion, uh, if we want to move things along, <laughs> we can move things along. I mean, there's a gavel in the drawer. So I'd like to. This came up today. There's um, a, a potential applicant, not an applicant yet, who would like to come to the board to discuss something that is and some actions that are not according to how we normally do things. So it's not a requirement yet. It's to discuss whether we would ever entertain that or whatever information they want to present. Will you back us up if we say that does may be essential to you, but that does not qualify as an essential function of the board at the moment? First of all, the motion is, for, is a request. It's not binding. Number two, of course, if you make a determination, the whole point is to protect even them. Mm -hmm. I've seen in other communities people who are developing projects and they're gung-ho until they read the newspapers 
the governors issued this declaration of emergency that people have to understand is a real declaration of emergency. Many of those people themselves don't want to go to these meetings and subject themselves to these things. So I don't know the specifics of this particular thing, so I don't want to get a phone call from somebody saying, gee, I've done this terrible thing to them. But it's essentially up to you, but we're trying to give you a tool that mm -hmm. you, can, you can blame okay, others. Okay, so I guess, uh, <laughs> yeah. to, be, to be blunt, it would be nice if um, those not familiar, as familiar with the Board of Health work were not second guessing our judgment. So that's, I think, all I would ask, really, is that if someone comes to you and says, hey, why they do that, send them back to us so we can go through the reasoning again. Um, rather than speculate or call and ask us if you want to understand why they may be complaining about some um, of our triage of what's essential and non essential. But, but, I, but I'd also say, like, I think the reality for lots of these things is as this evolves, if we look at what's happened with other communities, if you say, Boy, I really need my system installer here, like, they may not be working, right? Like, there's lots of other pieces. So, I think for us, I, what my advice would be. I certainly am enthusiastic about giving that re recommendation to the boards because I think it's going to be increasingly necessary um, in limiting the scope of business and managing what needs to happen right now because the bandwidth to do things is going to become increasingly limited. Mm -hmm. Okay. Darren, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, just probably within the last half hour, um, a special legislation, emergency legislation was passed allowing all boards to meet remotely. Um, the full board. So it's temporary, but, but during this period, um, boards can meet completely remotely now. It doesn't have to be a quorum of the board to have a, have a meeting. So right. I'm just adding that to the discussion because okay. it just happened. And remotely means call in type of right. Yeah, you could have a completely virtual meeting and it wouldn't be it, it's not even required to control. have one member present physically. You are not. Under, uh, oh. No, I read it on my phone in the last 15 minutes. But, but it's binding. I it's, 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 uh, and yet you still came here. It's a temporary, <laughs> <laughs> it, it a temporary <laughs> amendment to the open meeting. Line. Okay. Thank you. And there, would be a legal, wow. there would be a legal meeting? Correct. And even if there isn't a quorum? There would need to be a quorum at least remotely participating. Okay. 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 Right now. Prior to this amendment, you can have Jackie. Why don't you get in touch with Darren yeah. offline so yeah. you can have the record in the clerk's office? She yeah, can it just came out. Okay. The law just came Perfect. Out. So then you'll know how people can post. Yeah. And, you and used to be able to have remote participation provided you had a quorum physically yes. present. Right. So that's the change. The proposal was to, that the governor was supposed to be signing on to had one person, right. like quorum was reduced to one person. I thought it said all. I, I, I actually. Yeah, that's even better. We'll have to check to see okay. how the governor okay, David. presented it. I just wanted to answer a question about um, town hall. All town hall offices um, are able to access the town network from home. Um, we've already talked to all the employees about to make sure they do have access and can work from home on a work from home status if needed. So um, we're also discussing with Director Clean about a building wide sanitizing and then controlled access to the public. Um, and we would continue that as long as we're permitted to do that by the Board of Health and Select Board and Director of Emergency Management. So before we get too far astray, I want to—I made a motion. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so the motion, could you repeat it? I'm sorry. To request the board's committees of the town to postpone non-essential meetings for, for 30, 30 days. days. Okay. And to the extent that they have to have meetings deemed to be essential, that they address only essential matters at those meetings and postpone the non-essential matters so that the meetings are as brief as possible. Okay. Do you want to amend that to in-person meetings because of this reason? Yeah. It is all members. Okay. It is, it is all members can participate in Okay. Just a second. The intent of your motion, Paul, is to deal with in-person meetings, right? Not remote participation pursuant to the... Yes. Right. Okay. Did, Henry, did you have that? was the point that okay. you made. I was going to make with that law. Okay. You can still have virtual. We meetings. should add in person meetings. Yeah. Well, you, you just need to have some way for people to call yes, in. Fine. In Except that. Okay. So. I'm actually concerned about the 30 days. That's awfully short. 
you know, the third day is going to fight. We're not going to meet again for two weeks. Yeah, we can always vote to extend. We can, we we're can actually always schedule next week. Just yeah. you know, we're scheduled next yeah. week, and then I believe two weeks after that. Or we can make it until further notice if you want. But uh, you know, thirty days. I would do thirty. I like to have a specific. Okay. On this one, we as I think I said by email, we signed off on like twenty different. Yes. Amendments, emergency amendments to different parts of things, including the open meeting law. Can so, I just ask the obvious question? Yes. We're obviously all dancing around the elephant in the room. There's a meeting on Saturday. I know. Yes. Which is a, it, it probably I think it's still people if people don't show up. So I'll, I will address that. Like the public hearing has been scheduled for Saturday for for advisory, and I think to keep things on track with the budget and with town meeting schedule. Um, the plan is to continue to have that public hearing. There has been a notice put, posted publicly to everybody. You sent it all the department heads, Jeannie, that says, if you do not need to be there, it will be televised. I think it's important that people don't feel it necessary. And, and you only need to be there for your part of your Warren article or your part of the budget. I think that so, is an essential mo meeting at this point. So I had a, I had a uh, alternative plan. When we got to discuss the warrant, I was going to propose Instead of a town meeting on April 27th, we have a town meeting 30 days later at the end of May, and that the meeting tomorrow, be, uh, Saturday, be canceled. But I haven't got there yet because we haven't done the I think warrant. We, I think it's important to discuss that now. Okay, well, let's vote on your motion first. <laughs> yeah, let's vote on that before we keep adding things on. Um, Sean, we, yeah, we want to just, we'll deal with that I'm in a minute. Just it out there. I know, but we've got, what, if yeah. we get multiple questions on the table, it gets confusing. So, all those in favor of Paul's motion to recommend boards, the whole, uh, what Paul said, sorry. <laughs> 30 days. 30 days, for 30 days. There you go. All those in favor? For, uh, for in person meetings. Okay, for in person meetings, yes. Thank you. Now, oh, sorry, Daryl. Just a question. Will the town look into a conference calling sort of service that we could utilize? David, can you look into that? Yeah, we can. I talked to um, Dover, Sherbert, and Cable TV, the Rick, and okay. um, we can put a conference call module here. You're talking about for the hearing? For the no, 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 no. We're no, I'm talking about, about like, for so holding our meetings. Right. For, so oh, we yeah. all have a You can have a call in number where yeah, you we can, have There's calls. outside services that are free. Yeah. Like yeah. Google has one that can hold up to hundreds of people. It'd be nice okay. if the town could figure that out. Yeah, David, <laughs> David will. Uh, we have the equipment. We plug it in. No, it's not even but equipment. Think, it's a call-in number. No, it's right. service. Here we wouldn't yeah. call in. Yeah, like yeah we, from the home. whole point's to not be here. Yeah. Right, exactly. So David will coordinate getting a call-in service that the different boards can use. And would like we... Like a go-to meeting or something like that. Would we be inviting, so any applicants or something, so they would also be able to call in. So we might have an, quite a number of callers calling and dropping that's, off. I, yeah, I think that's fine with... To yeah, run a meeting remotely? Services. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. There's probably a certain business that... You have to. I, I don't know how that would yeah, work. Yeah, we're kind not of up sure to the yet. Individual right, boards, I would say. Okay. Um, I do want to talk about the public hearing. Then um, I think now, since we're on this topic, let's talk about Saturday's public hearing. So um, Saturday's public hearing is being driven by the fact that our town meeting is scheduled for April 27th, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's Monday the 28th. 28th. Tuesday, April 28th. Tuesday the 28th. Yes. Yeah. And that's six weeks away. Mm -hmm. It seems not to be in the interest of the public health to encourage people to go to town meeting in large numbers. We have a minimum quorum of 100 people. This particular disease affects older people. My observation <laughs> at being at town meeting is that often the attendees are older people, but that isn't to say the younger people don't show up and that they're not welcome, but it seems like it's a it's an older crowd, so we are tempting fate here by putting a lot of older people together in large numbers in a room where I don't think we need to. And the way I would deal with that is to postpone the start of town meeting by 30 days to the end of May, and that then relieves the pressure for ad advisory to have this hearing t uh, Saturday. The problem with the hearing on Saturday is that because they're considering the whole warrant, while it not, may not be 100 people at the same time, there are people coming in constantly all day. Yep. Okay, let's, uh, are we, I, I hear your point. I for, just want to keep for, moving, moving things along. I, the first question is, is it even possible? Is right. that that's, that's what I want to get the town moderator to 
and Jackie to um, also. In council. Yeah, in ca- Darren, let's let. Well. Okay, Darren. So, or, and then Mary, I want to hear from as well. Yeah. Through the chair, uh, before if you if you vote to postpone before the warrant is posted, it's a very simple. We vote to postpone either to a date certain or to not a date certain, and all it takes is a majority vote. Okay. You can still do it after the warrant is posted, but it becomes a much more complicated multi-layer okay. step. Well, the, the good thing is we can yes. postpone a lot of our agenda tonight if we do this. So, yeah. so, so that's what I just wanted to, that's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah. okay. well, look, J- but, J- but, Ma- Mary, did you want to talk? You want Jackie to? Um, the, the, uh, the MGL Chapter 3910A says that whenever the moderator determines the voters or in a town with representative right. blah, 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 no, may be unable to attend a town meeting called pursuant to a warrant issued pursuant to blah 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 that's the warrant mm-hmm. if it's issued um, the moderator shall consult with local public safety officials and members of the board of selectmen and then upon moderator's own declaration the moderator shall recess and continue the town meeting to a time date and place certain and it goes on but this allows a 30-day um, postponement. Okay. And as I understand it, NAS moderators is working with some of uh, people in the legislature to make it for longer if necessary and so But it's not so needed. She, she's looking at the wrong, uh, you know, with all due respect, that, that statute applies once the warrant is the board, that's what I said. The board, the board has the full authority yes. under chapter 39, section 10 to postpone by the majority. Okay. okay. So Mike, we haven't before, posted the warrant yet. Oh, Jackie, go ahead. I know you. Well, I have, a, I have a question about how does that affect the election? Because the the what we're hearing from the election from Michelle Tessinari is that um, only elections can be changed by court order right now. Then also well, by I, statute, I'm and sorry. so there's in the legislative package the governor is supposed to be producing is a change in. Okay. Yeah. He's going to. He's going to. Oh, because the election would have to be after town meeting. Right. I say. Yes, but we can also put questions. If if we didn't change the date of the election, we can still put questions on the ballot Correct. before town meeting, Correct. rather than do it after town meeting. Correct. You can do it either way. Okay. So, it, it's it, it, the point of the election is that the elections you can at least stream in one at a time. You don't have to all be. Mm-hmm. in the same place at the same time. Right. So it's a little safer. Right. I'm not as worried about the election as I am about a, 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 a town meeting. Mary, uh, okay. sorry. Daryl, do you, do you think it makes sense for us to delay town meeting by 30 days at this point to the end of May? Yes. Okay. That's, I, do you think, Mary? I think. Absolutely. Okay. So and I would if we have the luxury of hitting the April date and all this is passed and it was for naught, that would be an amazing outcome, wouldn't it? Right, so exactly. But we might as well be, be safe we now and avoid this Saturday meeting, especially since we're closing schools as of tomorrow to do the social distancing. We don't want to encourage everybody to come to town hall on Saturday. Cancel advisory. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, okay. so let's take a motion to... So moved. Well, can we finish the move? Do you want to make a motion, Paul, that we're going to delay town meeting? Do we want to pick a specific date at the end of May or just say we're going to postpone town meeting? Well, we need to you don't know when you can even schools. get it. We, oh, we got to talk with us. That's right. We got to check with the schools. Because we haven't issued the warrant, we can pick a date later. Later. Okay. So, Diane, you'll work with the schools to find a date in the end of May? Yes. Okay, great. So, I'll take a motion to postpone town meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Do we want to amend the motion to talk about advisory too? Or well, and then I'm going to take a okay. separate motion. Okay. okay. And then I'm going to make a motion to cancel the advisory public hearing. Okay. Postpone. I'll move or actually. postpone the advisory public hearing scheduled for March 14th. I'll okay. Second. Where, where's Steve Blady on this? Uh, I talked to him earlier today, and he said he respected whatever decision we made on this tonight. He understands. Everything that's going on, so that's a first because he generally doesn't respect what we have to say. So. <laughs> he, he does. I talked to him about it a little while ago. So oh, he's he's a great guy. Yeah. So I, so he I told he said he couldn't be here tonight, but I told him I would let him know after the meeting what we decided. So I'll second the motion. I can go on the town calendar and can. can okay, I know because the notices have gone out, so I don't know whether we should if there should be some sort of 
blast to the town of some sort that says it's been canceled because everybody got the mailings that said the public hearing was Saturday. So I don't know how we should communicate. I, write, I have the email of the guy at Dover Cable. I can have it be on Dover Cable. Yeah. And if somebody could put it on ne Je next door. Uh, Jeannie, will you put it on next door? Thank you. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. Can I have a. All those in favor? Um, I just one thing I. Go ahead, Daryl. Well, I was going to just say that Diane's probably not going to be able to find out because this end of May is when the schools have graduation and everything. The schools aren't going to be able to know what their dates are going to right. be either because they're canceling classes for maybe two weeks or right. maybe longer. Well, so graduation is scheduled for June 6th. At this I point. know, but, but I hate to tell you about the graduation. Yes. I, I think at, one, at some point that. If it's going to be an indoor graduation, for sure it's going to right. be canceled. Yeah, so my point so, is simply that the calendar is probably, the school right. calendar is not going it's to be up in the yeah. so, so we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. deal with scheduling it later. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to move, so I think. So, Tara was going to ask Okay, yeah, sorry. just one thing going. Sh sh Sean, your voice carries. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> so going back to the school David, closing you issue. So the point of closing the schools is so that there's less opportunity for the virus to spread among the student population and then be carried out and into have community spread. Uh, we don't want the lack of school to be replaced by alternative large events and, and grouping, exactly. so I will be addressing that. We'll work with the school for some sort of messaging on that. I just you know, maybe kids will rediscover the outdoors and <laughs> running around all the beautiful open space that we have here in by town. Themselves. But by themselves, not, yes. with a, not with a group of forty-five <laughs> friends. Right. With their favorite dog. Um, okay, thank you. And I think what I'd like to do then, since we're not having the public hearing on Saturday, and I know we want to keep these meetings brief, as Paul suggested in his emails earlier today, is postpone all the discussions of the Warren articles yes. and budget items tonight, and not do that. Um, so we can we can take those off. I know there there is one thing that I do before you move on to the war. Who's just a second, no. Darren? Darren, can you stop talking for a second? Sorry. <laughs> Who's controlling the war? No, no, no. I've got a bunch Jackie, of typos. I mean, Jeannie is. We have Jeannie. There's several typos. Um. So, so we're gonna skip over six and seven. Uh, on number eight. Um. One thing, I know, Sean, you have a reserve fund transfer. I don't, I'm wondering with the unknown, I don't know, how, what is the balance of our reserve fund right now? I think this is important because I know it with the Board of Health, there could be some stuff. Okay, thank you. 265000 260, Okay, good, because I want to make sure we have available funds for what might be coming up that's needed from the Board of Health. So, something that... It is needed and, is being and the emergency departments yeah. yes is being used already and it will certainly apply to police and fire council on aging no doubt mm -hmm. uh, and has already impacted the board of health is the amount of extra hours that people are putting in mm -hmm. uh, and it's the Board of Health staff already works extra hours so this is way above and beyond um, I can't even count the number of hours that we've all spent just this week. Okay. Luckily, you don't pay us too much, but we should be paying our, our folks fairly because That's if they right. were to take comp time for that later, yeah. we would be out of business for quite some time Absolutely. after this. So there has to be some consideration to how we compensate people. They're leaving family um, obligations and preferred, preferred activities and what have you. And Whether they're so an hourly employer or a salary employee, they should come talk to us so we can know what the overage is. Yeah. And and we can, can I, okay, so we'll just ask them if I guess everyone will ask their well, we, we can staff to track it carefully. The, yeah, we can deal with it in accordance with the personal admin plan. We okay, great. Um, on that note, I think if we have reserve fund transfers, I, I know that the Approve, need to be approved by uh, advisory and and select board, but we could always do remote meetings to do something like that. Yeah, that's yeah. Good point. so okay. and I'll talk to Steve about that and make sure advisory has that information about how they can do the remote meetings. Okay, so the, there's a minor expense coming up, but I think we might have enough in the board of health budget to cover it um, from the leftover from the in view of three thousand dollars for. In view of the emergency, projects, I would say just go ahead and spend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do a little 
deficit spending because I see most of my towns, by the time we get to the end of the year, there's so many accounts in deficit anyway, and you wonder how is it the people who are supposed to stay within appropriations end up with deficit accounts. If it's a small little amount, I'd say just go ahead and spend it. Okay. Yes, we're planning on sending out, you know, a sizable postcard, but a mailing to everyone with some information for anyone who hasn't gone to the, well, now the our website is improved, but to either the town website or have access to information in other ways and just to give them some information, although we're going to be rewriting that again, I think, based on all that's taken place in this oh. afternoon, essentially. So... Um, so I'd like to thank the staff for additional work we've been putting yes. in there. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Ellen, I've heard you've been doing a lot. Thank you very much. And Mark as well. So, so while we're on the subject of that, I want to heap praise on the Board of Health and the staff and all of those who have been working. I know you called me one night at 11 o'clock, I think it was, or 11.30. But you responded too, so that was great. <laughs> but the fact that you were working on the town of Sherburne unpaid at almost round the clock and, and that you've been handling it so well and I have other towns I work with and you're an inspiration really and I'm not just speaking to to Daryl although Daryl has been very important but every member of the board the staff all of you coming together working this hard you're trying to protect the community that's just I would so say that's, appreciated thank you it's also across the board in the town we had a fantastic meeting with the lepc uh convening again and sharing information and uh, you might want to speak to some of the things that are being planned so just so you understand a lot's going on behind the scenes i know it's not all completely communicated because we had it we had to spend time on action we are behind on doing the communication out to the community on what's been going on, but it has been time well spent. I yes. Think, so. um, I'd just like to start by echoing what, what Daryl said, that I believe Sherburn um, is in a good place compared to some other communities, and that's because of all the work that everybody's doing. So everybody's doing a great job, and the communication's been great. Um, as far as emergency management goes, we're working on a couple things. We're working on an incident command structure uh, for the town. Um, and what I'll be proposing is basically, it's called, uh, I know, I think everybody in here, most of the employees have taken ICS 100, NIMS 100, so going to be basically proposing um, sort of like a unified command system um, where both myself as the emergency management person and the Board of Health are kind of um, controlling uh, some of the things going forward or, or uh, coordinating some of the things going forward. Um, we're also working on a uh, town-wide uh, what's called a coop plan a continuation of operations plan um, that will address all departments some departments do have their own but uh, most do not um, which is somewhat normal so uh, that should be rolled out uh, the beginning of next week and again that will be town-wide um, for all departments and, and agencies so um, again that specifically needs yes. the public safety officials and the, the uh, uh, DPW officials need to have succession plans in absolutely place. so if you're out let's say you get this disease and i'm not trying to curse you <laughs> just hypothetically absolutely. you're out we need to know who's next in command and he's ready to step in right away without a need for the vote of the, vote of the board of selectmen no need for meetings right there same thing with the police department if yes. if there's if you're out you have to have somebody right next to you, and this, and, and and Sean, we, if you're out, somebody's got to be right there. Yeah. We know this should be like memos to us, so that we know who to look for. Because this stuff, this disease comes on fast, and if you have to quarantine or be in the hospital, we need to know that the town is continuing to operate. Okay. Absolutely, and you're 100% you're, you're right, and that plan will address all of that for every department. And it actually uh, designates the primary contact, a secondary, and then a third contact uh, or, or a leader for each organization. So, um, and I'll certainly, we'll certainly be getting that to the board as soon as that is finished. In that vein, do you want to mention a little about your response, your change in your response strategy of having only two people have kind of the whole. Absolutely. One of the things we have to limit the exposure of our emergency workers also so they're not exposed to things because it's not just the chief if you lose 
pack your medics, it doesn't yes. EMTs, it doesn't do any good. If your chief is fine, you know, you need to have the whole team. <laughs> so one of the things we're doing in other communities is, is sometimes the police respond first and then so, so you eliminate the police responding Absolutely. first. Yeah. yeah. So we can have officers and not have them all in quarantine. <laughs> Paul, let, let's let Zach. So, so luckily, uh, Selectman Dorenzis, we've already done that. Um, so our department has basically been preparing for this since um, the end of January, beginning of February, uh, through training and other means. Um, and uh, Lieutenant Bento and I met, uh, I believe, two weeks ago now. And, and uh, we basically then um, initiated that where the police department will not be responding to certain calls uh, well, they will be responding, but they will not be entering what we'd call the hot zone. Um, and we're going to limit our people that respond as well to basically minimize the the uh, impact on our people. Um, and and you know some of the other things we've been doing is trying to order um, PPE for the town for the for the emergency workers. We do have some, and we're actually in a better spot than other communities, uh, luckily. But you know we'd still like more, and and we're working on uh, numerous levels to try to accomplish that. And I'll point out that their plan to uh, to stay, limit the number of people yeah. who go into a situation, reduce that from what it's normally, uh, will also reduce the demands on the supply of Absolutely. protective equipment. So it's Good. a win-win strategy. <laughs> and not only it reduces the exposure, but it also reduces the use of the equipment, which you know, which is good. Yeah. Thank you. I think, um, do we have anything else with emergency management? Anything that with this? I think we're in good hands. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd want to move on. I think we have like one more item that has to be addressed tonight, and then we're going to be going to executive session. Thank you. Um, the only other item I have is under the town administrator. The Pine Hill Access Road letter of support is an item that David Linsky needs signed as soon as possible in order to earmark money potentially down the road for the completion of Pine Hill Road. Um, he, in order to ask for that money, he needs a unanimous support of our board to to look into that. So I would take a motion to sign the letter that we have in our packet for the Pine Hill Access Road, support for David Linsky to, to look for that earmark. Okay. Sure. Do I have a second? Okay. All those in favor? I'm, Thank you. I'm voting yes with the caveat that Oh yeah, we're still going to look into it, but it's it, right. that we we work with the neighbors. Oh yes, I've already talked to Lanny Rubin that once we form the committee, once we're down the road, as did I. and Sean did as well, that Lanny will be very involved. You know, he's very terrific. So I've already talked to him. Okay, so now we're going we're going to adjourn to executive session. The board will not return to open session. Item one, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to threat and potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town. And the chair so declares library. The chair does declare item two, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town. And the chair so declares police officer union. Chair does declare item three, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel at town administrator. I need a Push. second and a roll call vote. Are any of these essential? Um, can you, I mean, since we we're in an executive session and we've got the room pretty well cleared, I'd like to get through this this business, and I don't think they're going to take that long. What, one of them, we, I think, is we yes. have library every every meeting do we i can meet? give you a 30 second update it's worth it let's just instead of discussing it and drag it on we'll let's zip through it and not take breaks and let's It'll just go longer to talk i need that. a second and a roll call vote the motion yeah. seconded by mr yan mr Dur having a second i'm going to have a roll call vote mr durensis aye mr yan aye mr waldron aye mr johnson aye mr morrill aye having passed by a vote of five to zero we are now uh, the open session is now closed and we will not be returning to open session we're now in executive session sorry guys if i'm a little off